We are taking you behind the scenes of the National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. With unprecedented access to the scientists pushing boundaries and shaping our future, this show will take you to the cutting edge and beyond. And whether you're an expert yourself or just science curious, this is the show for you. Welcome to the Turing Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Turing Podcast. I am B, your host, and I'm here with Anika. Hi, Anika. Hi, B. Hello. Uh, and we have a great pleasure to introduce Lord Chris Holmes of Richmond joining us today. Hello. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> Chris's core policy focus in um, digital technology for the public good, with a particular interest in technologies such as AI. In Parliament, he specializes in legislation that deals with technology. So he recently introduced a private member's bill that proposes the regulation of artificial intelligence and was integral to the passing of the groundbreaking electronic trade documents bill. But also, as an ex-Paralympic swimmer, uh, Chris won nine gold, five silvers and one bronze medal across uh, four games, including a record haul of six golds at Barcelona in 1992, which is really cool. Um, so welcome. Um, so before we get onto the nitty gritty of the bill, uh, we just, you have a, such an impressive career. So we wanted to ask if you could briefly summarize your journey. I've been incredibly fortunate to have worked with some tremendous people at all different stages of my career, all of whom have helped me get to where I am now. I managed to get to Cambridge University from a comprehensive school. It was described as the worst comprehensive in the county. I'd like to think that some of the things I did helped to give it that reputation. <laughs> and I then finished at Cambridge and did law finals down in London practiced as a commercial lawyer in the city. Then when we had the possibility of bringing the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games back to London, I couldn't resist but to get involved and was fortunate to be one of the directors at London 2012 where we brought together everything that is great about the UK, looking outwards, welcoming and putting on a golden summer of sport, which had such a positive impact and the legacy should last for decades to come. And after that, got a phone call out of the blue from the Prime Minister asking if I'd like to join his team in the House of Lords. Obviously, naturally, I thought it was one of my friends doing a wind-up call. <laughs> uh, turns out it wasn't. And I was just blown away. I'm a working-class kid from the Midlands, so was totally stoked to be asked and I've been in the Lords for just over 10 years and very much have tried to link together the threads of talent and technology, inclusion and innovation and looking particularly at all of these technologies, AI, DLT, for public good. How do we get the best, the optimum outcomes from all of these technologies which we have at our disposal? It's Wordsworth said it centuries ago, but this is a pretty good time to be alive as well. well that's a great answer. <laughs> Definitely. We were just wondering as well, Chris, what would your child self think of your career so far? Did you imagine you'd be a lord or working on the topics that you're currently working on? I imagined all of it and uh, <laughs> just, it, it gone, gone about it in a, in, a, in a very programmatic way. No, it's uh, it's extraordinary. I always was into sport, so sport was always going to play an important part in my life. I didn't know to what level. And I always loved school and studying and apologies to anybody out there. That sounds a bit geeky, but it's true and we should just be our honest selves. So loved school, loved all subjects and really just things developed from there. But my younger self would probably look at me now and have something way beyond a quizzical expression on his face. <laughs> <laughs> also, this is the correct audience to, and no one is going to think you're a nerd in this one. Everyone is going to agree with you, I think, at this definitely <laughs> for this podcast. So we've mentioned in the intro how you've sp specialized in legislation that deals with technology, but the question is, how did you become in this? Particularly, how did you end up in this AI committee um, and, and bills and things? Technology has always been important to me right from the beginning because as I said I was at 
that comprehensive school. And then when I was 14, I lost my sight. And it was all of the fantastic humans that are around me, friends, family, teachers, swim coaches, who helped me out. But it was technology alongside that which enabled me to go back to that comprehensive school. So a very basic laptop. I mean, it was called a laptop. If you'd put it on your lap, you'd probably mm. get broken legs quite quickly. Possibly burned as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did It did put out a lot of heat, uh, more than light. Um, and with very basic speech software on there. But it was sufficient. And at that stage, I wouldn't have even been able to express it in these ways. But I really appreciate at that stage that we don't need magical, mystical, silver bullet solutions. Sufficiency is a really good place to start because that technology was sufficient, enabled me to go back to that comprehensive school, to get to Cambridge. And a more advanced version of that is what's still enabling me to do all my jobs today. Speaking about the artificial intelligence bill, uh, what is the correct process to write a bill and what is a private member's bill for those who don't know? Again, a a great question. It's uh, this parliamentary language which nobody outside parliament should need to understand. Uh, I was fortunate to have had a career as a commercial lawyer, so I'm kind of okay. I wouldn't make uh, any greater claims than that. I'm okay at drafting. So I thought we needed to move the debate and indeed the legislation on and it is time in my view to legislate so i wrote the bill and what happens in parliament members of both the house of commons and the house of lords which is the upper house and for people listening overseas the house of lords is equivalent to for example the senate in the united states and other uh bicameral uh, parliaments where they have two houses and the House of Lords is the upper house. So just to give that context. All members have the opportunity to put in a private member's bill. It's a piece of legislation which I and others can bring, put down on any issue that you so choose. But the key is there's a ballot then at the beginning of each session and you have to really get in the top 25 of that ballot if you're going to have a chance of getting your bill through the parliamentary process. So this year I came a very lucky number six. Um, Well done. Almost a medal. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's certainly in the final. It's it's a little bit away from the podium, but in this context, it's as good as being on the podium. So I introduced my bill in November and there are various stages to legislation. First reading, which is just where you bring the bill to parliament nothing more than that. Second reading, that's the first time for a major debate around all of the clauses and the issues around the bill. It then goes to committee and report where other members are able to suggest amendments and changes to legislation. Then third reading, then goes through all of those stages down the other end of the Commons, then goes to the Palace for the King to create it into statute. This is great. Before we get to the issues, do you want to tell us and explain to our listeners a little bit what is this new bill that you've wrote and what are just just key highlights that you want um, our audience to know about? So I call it the Artificial Intelligence Regulation Bill and what it does in short is seek to have a legislative and regulatory framework which will enable the UK to benefit from all of the opportunities from AI whilst being cognizant of the risks to consumers, the risks to citizens, but being very pro-innovation and laying out a fundamental point that not only is it possible to legislate simultaneously for protection and pro-innovation. It's absolutely essential to do so. Thank you, Chris. Um, We're wondering, what are the challenges that you faced when coming up with this bill? Or are there many groups who may oppose it? It's always challenging when drafting a bill. So I did a lot of research. I obviously read all of the government white papers and all of the consultation documents, all the consultation responses. And I consulted with all different organisations and individuals around all of the areas. So those involved in consumer protection, those involved in defending democratic rights, those involved in IP and copyright issues. So seeking to 
engage with as broad a range of people right up and down the country and internationally to try and coalesce all of that into a bill which takes some of what is in the government's pro-innovation paper, a lot of what the BCS talk about because they have some obvious expertise and a great constituency in this area, putting all that into a relatively short, because it's always important for private members' bill to be short and crisp. But as you say, there will be differences of opinion and that's all to the good. So, for example, some people may think we don't need an AI regulator. Some people think we do. But that will all come out in second reading. And again, to all the listeners, my aim is not to have a chorus of unbridled support for the bill. I'd really love everybody to engage with it and give their opinions and their perspectives and their views. They can hit me up on LinkedIn at Lord Chris Holmes and other socials. I really want ultimately to have a much greater debate around my bill, but through that, a much greater public debate across society around all of the opportunities and the risks in this thing that we variously call AI. Oh, this is great. From your research that you've done, is there anything that you've learned that you didn't expect to learn? That, or, or was it anything that you, amongst all of the conversations you've had, that was a surprise? I think what surprised me was when I looked carefully at the United States context, particularly, for example, in relation to IP and copyright. I obviously knew about the fair use principle over there and thought I had a pretty good understanding. But when I really started to look into the the cases and the Supreme Court case particularly, I was, I would admit, quite surprised how far on one side of the argument the court decided to judge. That, that really surprised me and pleased me that though there are many difficulties around IP and copyright in this country, we start from a better position with having fair dealing rather than fair use, which is much clearer and much tighter drawn. Okay, thank you. You're talking that you don't expect everyone to agree uh, with your with your bill. Um, in terms of how the process works, right? How do you compromise? when someone is in opposition to your bill? Because I imagine it's always a matter of compromise and not just one versus the other, but how can we reach, right? Very much so. And everything that I've done since being in Parliament has been working with people from all parties and indeed none, because listeners might know we might not know we have the cross benchers in the House of Lords and they are people who come from different backgrounds but aren't members of any particular party. But in everything that I've done, I've always sought to engage with people from right around the house. That was certainly true when we did, for example, the Electronic Trade Documents Bill last year. Again, another excellent um, and really tightly drawn technology enabling bill. But you're completely right that I haven't drafted every word with a sense that that is the final word on the legislation. There's always compromise. I'm absolutely sure that colleagues around the House will be able to make improvements and it will be considering them in the round, seeing what can be incorporated, seeing what is additive, but ensuring that the underlying principles that the bill is based upon, so transparency, accountability, assurance, interoperability, trustworthiness, ethical deployment. I wouldn't go too far down any compromise road which sought to cut into those principles because the key to my bill, I think, is that by having a principles-based bill, it enables us to move forward in a positive way rather than trapping us in time. It's not overly prescriptive. It enables agility and development through precedent and case law. And this is where in the UK and across the Commonwealth, 
we have such an opportunity when it comes to not just AI legislation, but all legislation, because we are in a common law jurisdiction. And that is such a phenomenally powerful force that we can have to deploy and to connect right around the world. So uh, we're wondering who it will impact most when, when, once it's introduced. Um, for example, how prepared are organisations to adhere to the bill if introduced? I hope it will positively impact across society and across our economy. But your question is rightly posed because as things stand, do we have the regulators who are ready to play their part? Do we have the statute book to be able to address the risks and enable the opportunities of AI? Certainly not. So one of the key roles of the AI authority, the nimble, agile, small regulator that I'm suggesting, is to look across the current regulatory landscape and assess the competency of our regulators to address AI, look across all relevant legislation to address its competency to deal with AI. So there's understandably a heck of a lot of work for all of us to do. But like all marathons, I really think from the legislative perspective, we've got to start taking those first steps. And as you said, it's a it's a long process, right? So so you, th there is time for this to to be implemented properly by organizations, right? For sure. You can legislate for almost anything, and it almost always is a disaster if you don't understand transition and implementation. Yeah. So when it comes to this bill, it's not a day one land and compliance comes there and then. It's very much a process. It's a legislative process, first of all, and then a process of implementation. But what's positive, though the government have said right now they're not minded to legislate, to regulate for AI, what they've constantly said all the way through is the time will come when we need to regulate AI. And in other terms, regulation is a positive force. Well, I share both of those sentiments. The Secretary of State said, now is not the time for regulating AI. Fortunately, that was in November. Yeah. She said the time wasn't in the immediate future. We're now in March. So I believe that if we're to make the best of this, yeah. we should certainly start on the legislative journey. If we're to make the best of it, wait and see is never a good approach. You've got a lead, you've got to get in the game, you've got a state where you believe the country can go with these new technologies and to plot a course. This You just answered the question that I was about to ask because a lot of the comments that we see around is that legislation is not going as quickly as technology is advancing. So we are getting all of these public publicly getting all of these models and and, and, and all of these scary things that, that the general audience is scared. And then legislation is not accompanying it at the correct speed. And then you were saying it's such a long process. So I, I guess it feels a bit counterintuitive that it's such a long process and then saying that it's not the time now. It seems like, okay, but it will be the time and we need to get this process going. As an add to that, yes, it's often said that legislation doesn't keep pace. And what's behind that often is people asserting that legislation is incapable of keeping pace. Oh, I see. And I just don't accept that at all. If you look at, just for example, the Electronic Trade Documents Act last year, we got that through in pretty short order. And it did something very straightforward. It enabled trade documents to be held in electronic format because of the possibility of blockchain technology. But I've described it as similarly the most important bill no one has ever heard of and the blockchain bill that never once mentions blockchain. And quite right, because it is enabling blockchains a technology which enables trade documents to be held electronically right now. But in the future, there'll be a myriad of technologies. So the bill sets out criteria 
sets out approaches which any technology has to meet. And this is the way I think that we can get on the leading edge in terms of legislating for these technologies. And similarly, if we look at the consultation that the government ran for the AI white paper, imagine what they could have done by deploying human-led technologies to transform how we do consultations. How many hundreds of thousands of people could we have connected with and enabled them to have a meaningful part in that consultation? But the, the consultation did a pretty standard approach and touched just over 300. Fine for those. But when we're talking about the possibilities and how significant these technologies are going to be for everybody's lives in so many ways, we should have looked at a way to transform the way we consult and connect with individuals, institutions, organizations, communities, cities. And through that, not only transform for the AI possibilities, but transform how we consult and how we do legislation across the piece. This is a this is great and a great segue to the next question. I'm actually, about to say the same thing, <laughs> yes, <laughs> because um, we were going to ask um, when creating a bill, how does one ensure that it's equitable and accessible for all? And I suppose I'll throw in a small follow up as in to say why is it important to ensure as well that it's equitable and accessible for all? It matters to me fundamentally, having had the path in life that I've had. I understood the critical importance and necessity for inclusion before I'd have even known that word, and certainly before that word was in common usage. If these new technologies are not accessible, inclusive by design, for me, what's the point? What is the point? We we designed buildings hundreds of years ago that weren't accessible, for example, for wheelchair users. Well, not great, but not so much known at the time. And we've spent decades rightly enabling those buildings to be accessible for all. Still a long way to go, but a lot of progress has been made. Why would we create these new products these new technologies and not have them inclusive by design from the outset because there's no additional cost in making something inclusive by design if you think it through at the outset. If you don't, it's not only difficult, but it's expensive and it's suboptimal. But even if people don't buy any of that, and I'm sure they do, just from a completely practical economic point, if you don't enable all of the talent, and if you don't fully enable all of that talent, how are you getting the best, the most optimal innovation that you could have? Of course you're not. So really, it's not inclusion and innovation, it's inclusion for innovation. This is a great thing because we had a potential extra question, but I'm glad you mentioned it because you're on the legislation side. So this is not necessarily just to do with AI, but with technology and inclusion, because how can potentially the legislator side, so having actual laws about it, can you um, make sure that manufacturers consider manufacturers consider inclusivity in their design and not just as an afterthought? So how can you make the difference from or attempt to make the difference from the legislation side? It's always making the point at the outset. So, for example, we had the Autonomous Vehicles Bill yeah. going through Parliament uh, a month and a half ago. And I put a lot of amendments down to that to push for inclusive by design. The government were of the mind that that's already taken care of. I don't believe it is. I think... Yeah. We have to manifestly state these things and commit to it because we all, in whatever role we're in, we all need to be inclusive leaders and we all have influence as inclusive leaders, whatever we do in our lives. And in the legislative process, 
just as critical to have that because these are the laws that we all have to abide by. So what is going on if a parliament ever passes a bill that people have to abide by but doesn't include them? A small additional example in a completely different area. There was this odd public realm concept that came out a few years ago called shared space. I called it so-called shared space. People here in London will have come across it perhaps uh, around the museums and exhibition road and by Sloan Square Tube, but it's been rolled out in many areas around the country. And it's essentially this, you take a general road and pavement layout, you take away the pavements, you take away the curbs, you take away the traffic signals, you take away the road markings, you take away everything, you take away barriers. And then the principle is that everybody will just be able to operate in that so-called shared space. Buses and blind people, toddlers and tankers, failing to appreciate anything around what true inclusion is, failing to appreciate the asymmetry of power, which is in those situations, a complete disaster. People have been injured. Tragically, people have lost their lives in these so-called shared spaces. So I worked for a long time pushing the Department of Transport to change their guidance and change their approach to this. And we managed to get that through but still some of these areas persist. But where they don't, local authorities who are understandably strapped for cash have had to make all these amendments and try and make them accessible and inclusive again. What an unfortunate way to have to spend your money when you can just make stuff inclusive by design from the outset with no additional cost. And then you get everybody able to interact, to connect, to create in whatever those environments are. And everybody can be their true 100% beautiful human self. That's a beautiful message. Yeah, that's that's response. <laughs> we were just wondering as well, so how does the government intend to regulate private companies? Um, we've had a few, there are a few kind of famous instances such as car insurance companies, which are in the news, um, you know, in light of potentially discriminatory practices or, you know, the cost of living crisis as well and other issues. Um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts? We have equalities legislation in the UK. We've got the Equalities Act 2010. We have the public sector equality duty, obviously for public sector bodies. And that's good as far as it goes. But the reality is you have to go far beyond that, both in terms of having the golden thread of inclusion running through all legislation, doing everything that we can as a parliament, but being very clear that the executive, the government, have to do far more in a coherent, golden threaded way to enable, to empower, to unleash, to do everything that the government should go and then say, over to you guys, individuals, businesses, organisations, cities, crack on, do what you do best. And there's a responsibility on businesses, likewise, to be inclusively led from the top, to look at their workforce. Does it represent the communities they're seeking to serve? Have they got a full understanding of inclusive by design embedded at every beat point of that business? So again, the prime minister, the cabinet, the government, parliament, completely have a leadership role, but as does everybody in every business, in every organisation, in every local authority, in every walk of life. We can choose when we get up every day, what am I going to do today to enable, to empower, to serve, to connect, to co-create? We can do that because we have the greatest good fortune of being born human. And I was going to say, completely <laughs> speechless, very inspiring. Um, which is great because I think we're at the end of our question. So I don't even know what I would ask after this. Um, Chris, do you have anything that you would like to add to the community that is listening right now? What I'd like to say 
to everybody. Thank you for listening. Thank you to everything that everybody does at the Turing. It matters so much to me. I had the good fortune to go to the same college as Alan Turing sometime after him, but the computer room bore his name and all of my late night, and I say late night, I mean early morning essay crises were spent in the Turing room. So it matters. We know how to innovate in this country. Turing, Lovelace, Berners-Lee, we know how to do this, to connect, to create, to bring out the best of all of us. So I'd love to hear from everybody listening, not just your thoughts on my AI bill, but your thoughts on technology for public good more broadly, and indeed your thoughts on inclusion and innovation and inclusion for innovation. And again, a massive thank you to you guys for having me in today and a massive thanks to everybody for listening. Do hit me up. Would love to hear from all of you. LinkedIn at Lord Chris Holmes. Fantastic. I was just about to ask um, in terms of your socials, you said LinkedIn uh, um, and uh Twitter potentially or yeah, we, uh, we, well X, X excuse yeah, me. We, 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 have, we have X as well, yep. Lord C. Holmes on X. And you can also find me at Parliament as well. But truly, I'd love to benefit from all of the knowledge, the expertise, the wisdom which is out there in your community because we will only achieve the great heights that we can if we really work together on this. It, all of the magic is in the journey, in the struggle, but it's a collaborative, it's a co-creating struggle. And what possibilities to be alive with these technologies, health, education, mobility, financial inclusion, digital inclusion, all of this is doable. And ultimately, it's down to all of us. Thank you so much and thank you everyone for listening. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. The show is hosted by me, B. Costa Gomez, Ed Kalstri, Joe Dungate, Christina Last and Anika York. Music for this podcast is produced by Jam and Sun. You can listen and follow via the link in the description or by searching Jam and Sun on Instagram. 